Welcome to Swansea. Uh, I'm Alan Dawson. I'm one of the consultant histopathologists here and part of the mortuary team. And I'm talking to you about what happens after the death of your patient. And we're here in the mortuary to help you with all the forms and the business of registration, which can be quite complicated. So I suppose the main message, what I want to say to you today, is contact us and we'll help you through it. So if someone dies under your care, you're going to be asked to fill in the medical certificate of cause of death, or what's commonly known as the death certificate, although officially the death certificate is what the registrar of deaths issues. So the one you're going to issue is the MCCD, but everyone calls it the death certificate. So to do that, you have to have looked after the patient in life and you have to know the cause of death. And therein is much of the problem. But it isn't really a problem. The cause of death is a clinical diagnosis and the level of evidence you need is on the balance of probabilities. So it's really very much a clinical judgment. And for most patients who've come into hospital, the cause of death is probably going to be the issue for which they've been admitted and you, that you're treating them for. So when you're asked to do the medical certificate and fill in why someone has died, first of all, speak to your team, particularly your consultant, and ask their view on it, and then speak to us in the mortuary, and we'll be able to advise you on the wording and whether or not the case needs to be discussed with the coroner's office. Now, this is the structure of the death certificate or medical certificate cause of death. Um, part one is divided into A, B, C, and then there's part two. You don't have to have anything in part two, but you only mention things in part two if they contribute to death. So that's kind of the also-rans. The main cause of death or the bottom line is going to be in the one series. And do remember that A, B and C are causally linked. They're just not a list of everything that's happening. So if you write something in 1B, you're saying it has caused 1A. And similarly in 1C, it's caused 1B, which has caused 1A. So they're causally linked. So here's an example from the government booklet, um, Advice to Doctors Filling in Medical Certificates. And this is a case here that you can see um, they've put 1A as intraperitoneal hemorrhage due to 1B ruptured liver deposit from 1C, a cancer of the colon. And they've got in part 2 diabetes mellitus. So what they're saying in this certificate is the bottom of the 1 series, this person has died from cancer of the colon and that diabetes has contributed to death in this case. Obviously, we don't know the circumstances, and perhaps this person's management with the peritoneal hemorrhage was complicated by their diabetes. You may see, think that this is rather over-detailed with this structure, and some people would just put 1A, disseminated carcinoma of colon, um, so there's many different ways that you can um, do the wording. You need to avoid just failure, like heart failure, liver failure, as a cause of death on its own without going on to specify what is the underlying reason for it. So the guidelines booklet talks about congested cardiac failure and gives an underlying cause here as rheumatic valve disease. Obviously, it's much more common that it's going to be ischemic heart disease in the kind of patients that you're likely to be dealing with um, in this hospital. And similarly, liver failure, um, perhaps a more common cause, is going to be alcoholic liver disease. So whenever you write something general like cardiac failure or heart failure, you must go on in the next line to give a reason for it. The bottom line of the one series is supposed to be the reason why someone's died. And when you're trying to fill in the certificate, and you've got, say, an old patient with a combination of, say, chest infection and heart failure, you need to just step back from the case and just decide which of those is going to be the predominant cause of death. Is it going to be they've died of their heart disease with the chest infection as a, 
uh, a sort of second issue, or is it going to be the other way around? And then you can structure the cause of death accordingly. If you really can't decide between two things, you're allowed to put them both together as equal causes of death, and you're supposed to write afterwards brackets, um, combined cause of death, but often many people just omit that last step. But do try and make a, a decision on clinical grounds between competing things that are going on in complex cases. And your consultant and we can give you advice about how you might want to structure it. Probably the commonest question that we're asked is, should de all deaths following surgery be referred to the coroner? And the answer to that is no, actually. Um, there are a few very few circumstances where deaths must be reported to the coroner and that's really when someone dies on table or in the recovery room. If someone has left the recovery room, even though they go to ITU still paralysed and ventilated, they have deemed to have recovered from the anaesthetic. So there are very few cases where the death must be reported to the coroner. Do you remember that Operations are carried out for serious conditions and it's probably going to be that condition that is going to be the cause of death in patients who've died post-operatively. There's no problem about mentioning the operation as part of the treatment for those conditions when you write the certificate. And indeed, if it's not mentioned, the family will often um, query um, uh, this because it's been a big thing in the story for their loved one leading up to the death. And when they go to register the death with the registrar of deaths, if the operation isn't mentioned, the registrar, when they conduct what is often an hour-long interview with the family when they register the death, will also think it's curious that the operation isn't mentioned and may well reject your certificate. So it's important to mention operations, but I'd like to stress that just because the operation is mentioned, it doesn't mean that this is critical of the operation, that it was in any way performed inappropriately or negligently. Unfortunate complications of operations, which happen sadly, frequently, are not negligence. So we shouldn't hide from mentioning operations on causes of death, and here are some examples. When you mention an operation, you should put in brackets afterwards the date. When you have written a certificate that includes an operation, you will need to get the coroner's office to cover your certificate with what's called a Part A, which the coroner's office separately faxes across to the registrar, so that when your certificate arrives with exactly the same wording, the registrar will accept it because the coroner's covered it with the Part A certificate. For the purposes of um, forms and definitions, an operation is something performed by a surgeon and things performed by radiologists or physicians, gastroenterologists and not operations. When you're dealing with the complications of treatments, try and link back the complication with the original indication for which the treatment was given. So here's an example with intraventricular hemorrhage due to warfarin, which was being prescribed for something quite some time previously, but it's going to be that that is the underlying cause of death. They've died of the complications of the treatment of that problem some time ago. The bottom example here is just a reminder to me to tell you to be very clear in your wording when you're doing uh, certificates about cancer because it's very easy to uh, give a misleading wording for where the primary is and where the secondaries are. So either spell it out very clearly like this example or stick to wording such as disseminated carcinoma of lung or something like that. If you just say carcinoma of lung, some people are not sure whether you mean to lung or from lung. So do try to be very clear on that and I can recommend the wording disseminated carcinoma of whatever. Well welcome to Wales and we have a lot of old miners still and you'll be having them as your patients 
And uh, this generally isn't a problem unless they've died of a respiratory disease because chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in a man who's worked underground as a miner is actually part of his occupational lung disease and is potentially compensatable and is therefore treated as an industrial lung disease. So it's not just your complicated co-workers pneumoconiosis with the white out of the x-ray, but a man with emphysema who's worked underground falls into the industrial lung disease category. So do beware of those patients who die of a chest infection in their uh, 80s and 90s that have been minors and do speak to us. You can tell if someone's been a minor because of the coal dust tattoos on their knuckles, knees and forehead. So it's pretty clear, uh, even if they can't give you a history, who has worked under, under, underground and who hasn't. Just a word on these... Um, sort of headline infections which everyone gets quite upset and concerned about and that's MRSA and C. diff and as you know most patients who die with these conditions die with them and not of them so you should only be mentioning them on the medical certificate cause of death if they've died of them if they've just died with them it doesn't need to be mentioned and just a word about hospital acquired pneumonia that's a terminology that we use all the time but if you write it on the certificate families often read it and think oh they gave my loved one pneumonia um, which is completely the wrong impression. So just avoid the terminology hospital-acquired pneumonia and just put pneumonia if that is going to be on the certificate. Falls are an unnatural cause of death and such cases would need to be discussed with the coroner's office. And here's just a little example about different wording. The example given at the top there is in the government guidance booklets and ends the one series with the loose floor rug and that's what some might say is curious wording really in that the bottom line the cause of death there is furniture related and you may look at that story from that cause of death and think you could equally describe it in the terms below that the death follows thromboembolic complications of immobility because of the fracture and the stroke. And so you can phrase it in a different way. So please speak to us, particularly on patients who die after unnatural events like falls or road traffic accidents. Do remember when you speak to the coroner's office, you're speaking to the officers and not the coroner. You hardly ever get to speak to the coroner in person. And his officers are civilians usually now. They used to be police officers, but most of them are civilians now. And they're trained and experienced in um, dealing with deaths and they can help you but you must tell them the details when you speak to them and usually what they want from you um, are things like the date of admission the date of death the address and phone number for the next of kin so have the notes with you when you speak to the coroner's office just a word about a hospital or consent post-mortem these are for medical audit and education purposes. They are not to discover a cause of death. So if you do not know the cause of death, you should not be even thinking about approaching families to ask for a hospital PM. And then if they refuse, which is their perfect right, say, well, we'll have to have a coroner's PM then. That's not the way to do it. If a post-mortem is required because a cause of death is unknown, then a referral to the coroner is made. To ask for a hospital PM, you have to have issued a medical certificate cause of death first. And we can help you with all issues related to post-mortems. 
just a final comment. Please don't leave all your duties concerning the administration of death and all these forms because you don't know what to do and there's so many other things you just get on with looking after your patients and don't, don't leave all these certificates for another day because there's a lot of people waiting on your decision about whether you're going to issue a form and what you're going to write on it. The bereaved family, the funeral directors, the people in the mortuary, the coroner's office, and they're all waiting for you to get on with it. So do not delay and speak to us in the mortuary and we'll be able to help you and get it done probably straight away. So there we are. Thank you very much.